Who? Who Nick is? <laughs> Are you aware who Nick is? This is Nick. Nick. Nick is responsible for doing um, seven out of the 12 works of art that are here. So I'm delighted that he's here to talk about his own work. And um, this, this exhibition came out of discussions between Nick and myself. And we were talking about the resurrection and what it means and how he's painted various things about the resurrection. Um, and I said, well, why don't we have an exhibition about it? Because he, he puts on exhibitions about Holy Week and, um, what did you say? They wanted Holy Week and then, take it down, take it down, Easter's come. So we're now in the Easter season and we're looking at the resurrection. Welcome. Over to you. Um, yeah, it's quite right. I think I, I'm off for most years. I'm asked to take, uh, put on, on uh, an exhibition of paintings and sculptures in various um, churches or cathedrals around the country. And inevitably, um, they say, well, when can you take them down? Uh, because it's Easter and it's, you know, it's gone. So can you take them away? And it reminds me a bit of um, uh, classic FM, that you get this wonderful build-up to Christmas with carols being played and then Christmas Day you get some carols, and then um, Boxing Day it's straight onto straps, and there's no mention of Christmas again uh, for another about eight months. Um, well, I mean it is a delight to be here, and uh, when Andrew asked me, and when he got this idea of this exhibition based on the, uh, the resurrection as a, as a as theme, um, I was very excited by it, and he um, put together a, an, a, a list of themes uh, that uh, between myself and Robert Wright and Eularia, we'd be able to uh, fulfil the themes. But the painting that was missing, um, and he asked me to paint it, was the empty tomb. And I thought, well, that is, that's a doddle. I'll, I'll knock off an empty tomb. Um, and it won't take me very long. Um, but I was mistaken. The empty tomb. Um, I found extraordinarily difficult to paint and I spent more time on um, this It's actually not the MT2. Um, how wonderful that uh, The Holy Spirit is, is a wonderful thing, but this is the road to a mess. But the empty tomb, which perhaps, I don't know if it's on here or not, is that little painting here. Um, I spent more time on that painting than I did on almost any of the other paintings here. And if you look really closely at it, it's almost a sculpture. The paint is so thick in the middle, where it's sort of layers of, of different techniques and effects that I overpainted time and again. How difficult it can to be, it to be to paint an empty tomb, a tomb that's empty. But it certainly made me think about what I saw as the empty tomb. Then on Good Friday, I was in um, my little Victorian, well not mine, but I think it was mine, little Victorian Butterfield Church in Horton Cumbe Studley for the Easter meditation in the afternoon. And it was very beautiful, and at the end of the hour, um, the organist was playing a Bach cantata. I shut my eyes and I listened to it. And I kept my eyes shut as he finished and he shut the organ lid down and I heard him leave. And I heard the vicar lock the vestry door <laughs> and walk out. And I heard the other rest of the congregation, all four of us I think, um, <laughs> slowly and quietly leave. And I stayed in there on my own with my eyes shut. And the church was empty. And I opened my eyes and looked at the empty chancel. Normally it's bedecked with gold and silver. And it's a wonderfully a sumptuous Victorian church. It's all been stripped for Easter. I looked at the empty chancel. And I suddenly heard birds singing outside. And then I was aware of the wonderful coloured light coming into the chancel through the stained glass. And I realised that it wasn't empty at all. It was full of transcendent light. It was full of the glory of God. And so I went back home 
and I got back on with Andrew's painting. Well, what does empty mean? Well, even if the physical body of Jesus was no longer there, there was still the physical presence of himself. There was still the physical, sorry, the physical presence of the stone, of nature. It seems, after all, that even a black hole isn't empty. It's just that the particles and the light cannot escape from within it, giving an appearance of emptiness. Initially, I painted the tomb black, but the intensity of the blackness overtook the painting, and the inside of the tomb became more solid than the surroundings. Got a camera. I even considered cutting through the inside of the tomb so that there was no paper. But then I realised that if you did that, you could still see what the tomb was mounted on. You'd see the backing paper. You couldn't make it empty. And then I decided I would gild it with 24 karat gold leaf, of course. Gilded it. It didn't help at all. It seemed to accentuate the fact that I couldn't cope with the empty tomb. I was trying to make it special, set aside, gold, a symbol of divinity. It didn't work. And finally, I decided I would paint the inside of the tomb the same colour as the dawning light in the background behind the tomb. The rising sun lights up the interior of the tomb, showing us the stone laid bare on which Christ's body was laid and the winding cloth, the, the winding cloths that um, his body had been wrapped in, laid on the stone. The tomb, like my little village church, was not empty, but it was filled with the radiant beauty of God. I'm only sorry I don't have a slide to show you of it. So you must, if you haven't seen the painting, go and look at it. It's that very tiny one there. And it's a shame I haven't got a slide, because <coughs> As I was painting it, I realised that the design of it, um, perhaps I'll just narrow it I realised as I was painting it that the I purposely started to change the shape and put this tail-like shape in here of the palm tree. And it was based on the whale. Because often when I paint or carve the resurrection or the empty tomb, I think of um, Jonah and the fish, Jonah and the whale. There's a, a, a resonance with the story of Jonah who's swallowed by the great fish for three days and then he's resurrected. And so in a sense, I saw this as an open mouth and this as a tail. And actually afterwards I thought, well you could actually have a palm tree that was going like that, coming out the top of the whale, so it looks like a, a spout of steam. But it's a connection with Jonah. Thank you, Andrew, you're brilliant. No, no, that's done, thank you. Well, let's see what the next slide is. Oh, that is a delight. It's angels at the empty tomb. The tomb here is certainly not empty. The angels are the light source of the painting. This is just a detail of, of the painting there. And the painting is better in the sense that you can see that the angels are the light source of the painting. But the light doesn't come from them. It's really a reflection of the glory of God. In the same way that the moon shines because it reflects the light of the sun. And in all my work, the landscape is not just a backdrop. It responds to what's happening, to the event. So in this case, the trees lean back in the presence of the angels. 
who are present of God. Once again, the dawn reflects the light from within the tomb. It's interesting, when you read accounts of this event, how much they vary through the Gospels. St Matthew tells us that guards are placed at the tomb and that two Marys visit the tomb. That's Mary uh, Magdalene and Mary, mother of James and Joseph. That an angel rolled back the stone. That the guards became like dead men in their fear. It's an extraordinary image. It's one of those images in the Bible, I think, that people often don't see. It's, it, you know, I often read things over and over again and then suddenly think, I never noticed that. The idea of the guards falling away. It's a bit like the idea of the naked man at Gethsemane running away. <coughs> it's such a bizarre image, and yet so often you don't notice them. It's only when you reread it, you suddenly it jumps out. St. Mark says that the two Marys and Zalame visited, and when they arrived, the stone had been moved, and they saw a young man dressed in white, presumably an angel. St. Luke says that the women discovered that the tomb had been moved, and they were met by two men, angels, in clothes that gleamed like lightning. What a lovely image. And St. John tells us that Mary Magdalene alone visited the tomb. She found the stone moved, and then she returned with Peter and John. After they left, I'm going to assume it's John, that's the disciple that Jesus loved. It is John, isn't it? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I had to ask because I knew I'd be picked up on that if I was wrong. <laughs> After they'd left, she returns, and or she's still there, but she is greeted by two angels in white where Jesus' body had been, sitting where Jesus' body had been. So I'm not an illustrator. I'm not a biblical illustrator. I respond to scripture. Um, sometimes it's not even the scripture I respond to. It might be Christian iconography from a different tradition, like Michael Rose of Shaw. In this case, it's a combination of all those scriptural verses rolled into one. It's what I respond to as an artist. And so, there are two angels in the tomb, three women, no sign of the guards. Um, they've completely fallen away. But in a sense, they are like the trees that fall away in the presence of the angels. Eularia Clark picks up the moment when Mary Magdalene is greeted by what she believes to be the gardener. In, in her painting, Mary sees the risen Lord against the light. So his face is in darkness. At first looking at the painting, it seems like the figure is empty. It's sort of black emptiness. But like darkness, as you look into the darkness, as you look into the blackness, you start to see detail. You start to see your eyes become accustomed and you can just about make out the face of Christ. And it's lovely because it's almost as if um, this is Mary Magdalene's experience. She looks at the emptiness of the blackness, doesn't recognise and out of the blackness comes Christ. And it took me a long time to see that, to think about that. Having seen the painting, I realised that our experience to it is like Mary Mag's to the appearance of Christ. He says to her, do not touch me, I have not yet returned to the Father. And that was, in part, the inspiration for, of this triptych, which I painted um, as a commission. On the far right-hand side, oh, you can't see it. Um, on the far right-hand side, oh, you have to take my word for it. Lisa, is there any way we can adjust it so we can see the image? On 
the far right hand side, it's the same thing. Uh, Mary reaches up to touch Christ and he says, don't touch me yet, I'm not yet ascended. But against that, on the far left hand side, is that wonderful story of St Thomas where Jesus says, touch me. Oh, you are marvellous, thank you very much, it's brilliant. Um, so on the far left hand side, Thomas reaches across to touch the wound in the side of Jesus. And then in the middle, this wonderful story um, from St Mark, um, and perhaps I'll read it quickly. Um, but it's that lovely story where Jesus is in the crowd and um, a woman who had a problem bleeding or something, she reaches up and touches his cloak with her faith so strong knowing that she would be healed. And he turns and says, who touched me? I felt power go out of me. What an extraordinary thing. And so I wanted to capture that moment. And uh, the, the woman is in blue at the bottom. And you can make out on the painting afterwards. She pulls his cloak. And he turns and looks. But his eye looks directly at us. It is as if we uh, touch the cloak of Christ. And the eye is the centre point in the whole painting. I love that story. And it's quite a different account um, to the one in Matthew. That's Mark 5. I won't read it. Now I put this one in because it, I, I'm working on this at the moment. Um, and it, 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 I suddenly realised it's almost exactly the same design in reverse. I'm doing a series of five mosaic panels. Uh, they're about half as big as this again. Um, and I'm on my third one. But the one on the left, which is unfinished, um, is um, the Noli uh, Mujanteri, the um, don't, don't Touch Me. And um, this is unfinished because I ran out of that colour of small tea and I had to send to, to Venice. And uh, knowing the Italians, it would be about six months before I get any more. Um, but anyway, that's, I put that in because I'm working on that. And it's a lovely theme as an artist to work on. I've come to realise, and probably you have by now, uh, that for me, there is no such thing as an empty tomb. I produced this uh, carved ombre for Ifley Church a few years ago, and in it we see two, uh, the two angels carved in uh, limestone uh, presenting the door of the tomb. The angel on the right uh, actually, with his hand, presents the keyhole. He actually says, this is the way in. And the angel on the left has his, her, its hand raised in, in praise, in glory. And my dear friend Jan told me a lovely story that her granddaughter, I think it was, um, responded to this sculpture in the way that I really would hope that everybody would do, is she went up and put her hand in the hand of the angel. Absolutely lovely. That's the way to respond to art. But rather than show us the emptiness of the tomb, they direct us to the body and blood of Christ, of the sacraments kept within this ombre. And the electric light that illuminates the, the, the little ombre, which usually in churches is, is sort of red light, I wanted this clear, cold light, because for me it's the light of the, the dawn. It's cold, but it's fresh, and there's something invigorating and it cuts through and so the light here is this sort of slightly bluish slightly um, cold light perhaps the nearest i've ever got to producing an empty tomb in my art is um, this uh, altar for uh, murfield priory it's um, a stone altar uh, um, in the chapel of the resurrection dedicated with themes 
uh, of the resurrection. So the front panel is the supper at Emmaus. And I wanted to capture a sense that um, the disciples may well have been absolutely terrified as well as uplifted. And so hopefully there's a whole of human emotion there. There's, there's fear and shock and delight. Um, and, um, and the rather fun thing about carving this was I left the, the broken bread as raw stone. So that was the only bit that wasn't carved. It was just raw stone. It's actually the best bit, probably, because <laughs> I haven't actually touched it. Um, but it was made in panels, the whole thing, and each side was decorated. This was the, I was working on it in my garden. Uh, of things from the resurrection. And this actually, I've just noticed, is very similar to the painting that I did um, of uh, Christ's appearance on the shore, recalling the disciples, if you like. But the back side of it, and this is a painting, oh sorry, this is a, a photograph of it before it was mortared up, so I just fitted it, so you can see this little light. But I wanted to show you because it's an empty tomb. And so the back of it, uh, if that's what you call that bit of an altar, the bit nearest the east end. Um, it, for me, it meant that the person celebrating the Mass had their feet in the tomb. And so the sacraments were put on the altar, on the tomb. And this was, for me, to show that it still isn't empty, that it's come to life again. And we can see the stone to the right has just been rolled away. And the priest stands with his or her, in Murfield's case, probably his feet in the tomb. Now, this sculpture, which is um, over there, the entombment of Christ. <clears throat> I wanted to talk about this just briefly because it meant a lot to me to produce it. I had the idea of producing a whole set of um, sculptures that would then probably travel or um, based on the passion of Christ and that would perhaps travel around um, the country and people would sort of look at them. Um, they wouldn't be for sale, they just... They'd... Well, I do them as, for myself as a meditation really, a private meditation, but they, I thought they might be of use. Um, but when I set out on carving this sculpture, I hadn't realised what it would demand of me and it was as if the carving of it, um, I actually participated in the entombment of Christ. So, first of all, I attacked the raw block of stone with a big chisel and a mallet, with a hammer actually, as if I was quarrying out the very sepulchre itself. And you can see the top marks a raw stone where it's broken, where I've had to hit it really hard to cut into the, to make the sepulchre. And then using a slightly finer chisel, I tried to find the body of Christ in the tomb. And I carved around it, and Christ's body appeared. And I wanted it to be a sort of almost fetal position. It is as if he is in the womb of the earth, ready to be reborn. Twice, shards of stone went into my eyes. It was as if something was trying to stop me doing this. And as I hollowed out the sepulchre, Christ's body appeared. And I then started to cut further and find the landscape appear. I cut all the way through to create a, a sense of, hopefully, that you're in the sepulchre, looking out. It was as if the process of the crucifixion was reversed. I dug out the tomb, revealing the dead Christ. And then I carefully chiselled the winding cloth, very carefully. And finally, I sharpened my smallest chisel and I cut the wounds into his body. The process had started with heavy, pounding blows with a mallet and ended up with a delicate tapping of a very sharp chisel. I've carved this theme several times, and each time I'm taken taking back to the night my mother died, of sitting next to her as she laid in her bed, her soul already in the hands of her guardian angel. <laughs> and in this sculpture, my mother is transfigured into Christ. Her bedroom has become the sepulchre. 
but the light and the hope of resurrection is the same. And coming from that sculpture, this painting came as well, which is based on Holy Saturday. It's, I called it the waiting, or the stillness, I think. Um, I'm not very good with titles, I forget what they're called. But it could be the stillness. And it is that extraordinary moment when, on Holy Saturday, when Christ has been crucified, he hasn't risen. We know he rose, but he's still, we're still awaiting. And there's a sense that he might, he might not. And there's this balance. For me, it's, a, it's, a, it's an incredible tension. I never assumed it was going to happen, but I know it did. And so Holy Saturday is an awkward waiting day. And this is summarised in this painting for me. When the only hope, when you look very closely in the painting, is on the top right-hand side, there's a green leaf that shoots out of what appears to be a dead tree. The healing of blind Bartimaeus. Even when Christ's body is no longer in the tomb, his presence remains. Perhaps emptiness can, be truly, tr can truly only exist where Christ is not. For many, Bartimaeus was blind because he, because he couldn't see. He couldn't see what others could. Many might have thought that his world was empty. And yet, Bartimaeus could see that Jesus was the Christ. He could see what others could not. His world was not empty, but truly full. And here we have Christ appearing on the shores, recalling the disciples, much as he did when he first appeared to Peter and the other fishermen at the start of his ministry. Peter is called once again, and so are we. And perhaps I could finish with this final image which is one of Robert Wright's paintings, which I'd never seen before this exhibition. And he said that you had to work at his paintings. I think you do, but you also have to, with abstraction, you have to allow time to let them sink in, to resonate. And this painting has done that with me. The more I look into the image, the more I can see. It was a bit like looking at Eularia's painting. The shapes and colours seem to move and colours appear that you didn't think were there. And through apparent chaos, a cross appears. And what is ordinary is transfigured and it becomes extraordinary. The flat colours become gold. And not just flat gold, there's stuff going on underneath the gold that gives it a vibrancy. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvellous in our eyes. This is the door day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Thank <laughs> you.